uh, and I will get them um, at the end of the presentation. And if they're in chat and we don't have time to get to all of them, I can answer them and send them to Christine and then she'll forward them on to you. Um, or we'll find some other way of making sure that you get your answers. Okay, so as I'm sure you're expecting, I'm going to be talking about the use of technology to support applying educational theory to practical use. Um, I'm going to be talking about healthcare education a lot because that is my area of specialty, um, but I'm hoping on the whole, you will find this useful for whatever you happen to teach um, because obviously all of our students then go off and want to make practical use of it during you know, their education and afterwards when they um, finish their training as well. So um, we'll look at the online tools which support the application of theory to practice, um, certainly within um, virtual um, healthcare education, it's really useful because it, it makes sure that students can have um, clinical experiences that we couldn't otherwise guarantee. Um, hopefully that would be the same for your students as well, but you would probably need to adapt it so it, it suits the needs of your students. Um, but I also think that using online tools, um, not just for the delivery of the education, but as a resource package, you know, part of kind of the, sort of the toolbox of what we offer students as part of their educational practice really um, can help them to um, deepen and reinforce their learning at a pace that suits their individual needs, you know, in a place where they might feel most comfortable to do that. So that is um, what we'll be looking at and considering during this session here. If I can remind myself how to, oh, here we go. I just want to advance the slides. So this is um, one of the slides where there's going to be some audio, but only briefly. And um, it's nice because one of my colleagues, Dave Hunt, is, is part of this session now. And a long time ago, Dave was sort of my first foray into thinking about how I could, because I've always been really interested in kind of um, using digital education and digital aspects, adding it to my education and enhancing it this was way, way before the pandemic. And so Dave was our learning technologist back then. So he was my first person that ever kind of introduced me to this amazing kind of world that was out there that we weren't using fully. And I'm forever grateful to him for that. And um, more recently, but still pre-pandemic, um, we were talking about, because um, I went to one of his sessions, he delivers sessions within our university for um, help educators who aren't necessarily as comfortable with using um, digital technology. Um, and I went to one of his sessions and, and, and he was talking about, um, he was referring to virtual reality as an alternate reality. And I thought that was really unusual and interesting because I thought actually that's so important, kind of the turn of phrase that we use to reference things and the impact this can have on our students. And I think it's like, it's worth always reminding ourselves of this. Um, and, and, and I referenced Dave for using the, the term alternate reality, but I'm pretty sure he did say he got that phrase from somewhere else. But because I can't remember who that is, I am going to reference Dave with that. And then if you want to know exactly where he got that phrase from, I'm sure if you ask him in the chat, he will be happy to tell you. Um, and, you know, it's particularly important thinking about um, if this whole session isn't just going to be about virtual reality. I'm really sorry. I don't want to mislead you, but I just think this is quite important in, in overall thinking about, you know, using um, digital aspects for education that kind of the words we use um, and the influences can have on the perception. So if we're talking about virtual reality instead of an alternate reality, for example, or um, parallel reality or equivalent reality, then it might give the impression that it's less real and maybe of less intrinsic value, which of course it's not. And I really like there's um, on Amazon, there was this series called Future Man. And I got really into it, actually. And this guy that you can see on the screen here was a hologram. Um, and, and it delves into why virtual reality actually isn't much different to standard reality from a psychological perspective. And so I've, I've, I've cropped a really short clip, which I wanted to um, play for you, and hopefully you'll be able to hear it, which explains it much better than I can do myself. Denise, the sound's not working. Okay, right. That's unfortunate. So what he is saying is that 
reality is just signals perceived by the brain. So the only thing that's real is your mind and everything else actually is just constructs. So there's no reason why virtual reality or an equivalent reality, it isn't, you know, the same as, you know, normal reality, standard reality. Um, it's a shame you can't, if anybody's desperate to hear that clip, I can um, send you a link to where I've clipped it on and, and um, I've got it um, set up somewhere privately. So I think it's, it's not just me. There's, there's been something called the Topol Review in healthcare. And, um, you know, within that review, it says the future of digital education must begin now. So this review was done, it was published in 2019, just before the pandemic. Um, it identified virtual reality as one of the top 10 digital technologies expected to impact 80% of the NHS workforce, um, increasing proportionately during the next 20 years. So we are training or educating those healthcare professionals now, and they will be using what we've taught them within their career. So it's really important that we are able to embrace digital technology make them comfortable with it, make them understand that it's okay to use it, make them understand how it can be applied to health care. And I'll, I will talk about that a little bit um, within this um, and hopefully it will be relevant to you as well. The World Health Organization um, is using augmented reality for um, continuing professional development. So um, here you can see, um, this is a uh, this little guy here will sit on your keyboard or wherever you want to place him in your house or in your office. And it's just um, for us to practice donning and doffing personal protective equipment. Now that's really useful for people who might not necessarily be able to access um, a face-to-face -face workshop, uh, you know, in, in a room together, for example, rather than it being online or, or they want to do it after work or whenever. So that it's really quite handy. And it's great to see something like the World Health Organization now offering you know, augmented reality as, as part of continuing professional development. Um, and I think it, it does make it, um, it's a nicer way to learn. It's really nice to have this little augmented figure sitting there, you know, working you through um, a, a very essential skill and what became an even more essential skill very soon after this was released because of the pandemic. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm on the right hand side of the slide here talking about the bio digital um, image that I've cropped here. Now, for me, this is a modern version of the anatomy coloring books we used to have when I was a nursing student back in the dinosaur age. And they were brilliant for helping you kind of memorize the anatomy and physiology that's so important to kind of, you know, it's the building block to all the health care we give. Um, and now we just have them digitally, but it's the same thing and it, and it, it works in the same way. Um, and I can remember, you know, like we, we used to sit in the pub studying. Um, this was a long time ago and um, we wouldn't be allowed to go to the toilet until we like were able to recite the necessary thing that we were studying. And, you know, part of that science was anatomy and physiology. And so now these make that sort of thing even more possible, except that we no longer, you know, say that it's okay to go and study in a pub if you're in healthcare, because we've learned a lot about kind of what that sort of thing does to our body. But it, the principle is there, you know, it's a fun and different way to engage with your learning. And it allows, um, it makes learning more equitable, because some students, many students actually are very visual learners, and they can go in and they can do things, they can see it, they can handle it practically. And I think the key point I'm trying to make here is that um, these sorts of platforms facilitate students to learn at their own pace, to learn in a place they feel more comfortable, wherever that may be, and whatever the time of the day it is, but they do need to have connectivity. But that's becoming more and more of an accessible thing for more and more people, you know, in our um, society nowadays. This um, top middle one um, image here is a video. Um, Christine's going to make my slides available, I think. So you'll be able to click on this video and have a look, but it's physiotherapy and it's um, augmentation um, for, and it's a, a patient and a practitioner and they're able to engage with each other and um, do the exercises. And the practitioner is able to check and see the progress and the patient's easily able to demonstrate their progress. It it's really works well. And one of the things you'll find if you go on the Chartered um, Institute for Physiotherapists, they do a lot with digital 
um, digitization of care, of education, really innovative stuff. Uh, so um, it, it's really worth going on, on their website and having a look at what they do. They, they are really quite advanced. Now, I can't, I can't see if you've got any questions that are urgent. So it, feel free to interrupt me um, if there's something you want to ask that can't wait until the end. So this slide here, um, I have quoted a bit from my own research, which sounds very, oh, I don't know, snobby to me, but um, I don't know how else to do it. Um, so I did research looking into virtual reality learning environments um, to see whether they were of benefit to students, to see what the, the impact was on, on their education. This was pre-pandemic and um, 300 students took part and the research showed that virtual reality learning environments offered a space where actually students could experience a physical manifestation of psychological engagement with the characters in the scenario. You know, very much like I suppose when you're, you're playing what I will call a video game, but probably isn't the right word now, but you, 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 you know, you get jump scares, you get all kinds of kind of psychological engagement, don't you, within physiological, uh, physical manifestation of that psychological engagement within the game. This is similar, except it's not a game, it, it's healthcare. Um, and there's, there's some scenes here. This, these are some students, because I did, I had quantitative data and qualitative data. So this is the online focus group. So I had students from around the world and around the countries and um, online focus groups work the best. And I tried to keep them small because um, it just makes it easier for transcribing afterwards. So they're talking about a, a part in one of the scenarios where they have to um, do a postnatal examination of a baby and the baby's eyes are quite red. Um, and that can be indicative of lots of different things, including a shaken or, or abused baby. So, um, and at one point, you know, the husband walks in the room and he actually blocks their access to the exit from the room and those sorts of things. And they said it made them feel really uncomfortable. And in this um, bit here, if you get close enough, you see she's got some fading bruises on her arm and around her face. There's lots of like evidence that there's been a big party. The house isn't really child friendly. Um, there's lots of little things, you know, some of the artwork's not necessarily appropriate for young children. You can see that there's a boy sleeping in the dog cage, you know, those kinds with the dog. Um, but there's lots of things where the student can look around and, and sort of explore where you might not be able to in real life and, and, and lots of different layers and threads where um, she can discuss these issues with the woman during this episode of care. I say she, we do have male midwives as well, but I default to she, because um, that's the majority of our students. So apologies to any male midwives who might be in this session. In this scenario here, um, this is a, a scenario that was developed where students could go in and work either with their own professions, um, practitioners of their own profession, or with students from other professions, paramedic, um, ambulance, nursing, uh, medical students, et cetera, and so on, um, you know, um, blood labs. Um, to save the life of a woman who's having a postpartum hemorrhage. And, and while these scenarios could take as long as a student wished, this scenario was timed to a certain amount. We only have a certain amount of time to save a woman's life when she's having a postpartum hemorrhage. So it was restricted to that time. And if they didn't resolve the hemorrhage within that time, the woman died within the scenario, which the students found, you know, quite impactful um, and, and beneficial in an awful sort of way. But it's also, it's a safe fail, isn't it? If a woman dies in the scenario, you haven't killed an actual person, but you have learned from your mistakes. And you've also learned how to work with other people from different professions. Um, this can be synchronous or asynchronous. Um, the woman's actively bleeding within the scenario. The blood's dripping off the bed onto the floor, um, as it does sometimes in real life. So the students found this really useful um, 90% of them said it offered opportunities to learn and practice their clinical intuition, their gut instincts, so things that are happening that aren't necessarily clinically measurable yet, but their, their brain is picking up on it. It's a very useful skill, and they do need um, opportunities to practice these skills. 80, uh, nearly 80% said it supported them to practice the humanization of their health care. Now, you know, that is part of health care. There's no point having just the health if we don't also have the care attached to it. So it's, again, a really important skill for students to be able to experience. These learning environments are no good if they can't practice those skills. But luckily, the students felt they, they, they could. 
they all report an uh, 94% reported an increase in confidence compared to pre-use, and there was a positive impact overall noted by nearly 86% of the students. So some of the students didn't find it ideal, it wasn't their favorite part of learning, but you know, 86% of them found it very useful indeed. And I think those are pretty good um, figures, um, considering you're never going to please everybody, and we shouldn't, with, with one aspect of of education delivery and we shouldn't be we should be offering students a full toolbox that they can access from they have different learning needs at different points in their education and depending on how they're feeling themselves etc and so on so the more we can offer them the better but of course it costs money to have things like virtual reality learning environments and indeed the company that we were um, we had developed these with um, and were then buying user licenses from decided that actually um, they were going to discontinue offering that. Um, and although we, you know, had our intellectual copyright and they still belong to us, of course, we had no platform then to run them on. And we were partway through a run of a curriculum. So half the students had had education within these virtual learning environments and those opportunities. And I was faced with this very real reality that actually the, the rest of the students for the run of the curriculum wouldn't be able to access that, which was impossible. That couldn't happen because we have to be able to offer our students equitable education. So I then frantically started trying to think of ways where I could, you know, move beyond this. I had to find a way to be able to offer forthcoming students, um, you know, an equal opportunity to learn, which I will tell you what I've done. Um, the, this image here is students using um, one of the virtual reality learning environments. They're in a classroom as a group. They've given permission for me to share this photo with you. Um, and this was their introductory session to it. So getting them used to using it. After this, I did learn how to kind of explain to them how to do it online, but I was still new to it at this point. So I was brought them all together. They're using it on various devices. You can see them using cardboard. We did have a hands-free um, headset that um, Dave loaned us, um, which the students were able to use. They were accessing it from iPads, laptops, their mobiles, et cetera, and so on. Um, and as I said before, I think, you know, although I keep referencing healthcare students because that's the area I work in and that's where I've had the experience with this, I, I think this is applicable to all students. They all want the same things from their education, right? They want it to be modern. They want it to be useful to them. They want it to be validatable. Is that a word? You know what I mean? It's got to be valid, right? Um, it's got to be flexible. It's got to suit their needs and their needs are changing. So it, it has to be able to flow and change dynamically with them. And it has to be applicable to their practical use during their education and also after qualification. There's no point teaching them something that's not going to be useful after they've qualified. So... I had this issue where I suddenly didn't have this, this equipment that I would, had been able to use. What was I going to do? So I started looking around at other things that could be used and it had to be things that were free because there was no more money. You know, so I went out looking for ways we could give them the same experience using different platforms that also happened to be free. So, um, oh, this picture here is just another shot of the um, postpartum hemorrhage one that I was telling you about where students could work with other healthcare students. So this is just them in a room together, virtually learning together and, and, and trying to save this woman's life and, and supporting her husband and making sure the baby's okay and, and so on. So I'll talk to you a bit, um, some of the, so these things here, um, with the virtual reality learning environments, I was able to safeguard the students in there. They were closed environments. No other students could go in there except students I had given access to. So I was then faced with trying to find different platforms that were free where I could bring the students in for learning in a different way. And so safeguarding them did, and also, you know, kind of making sure they were corralled into learning what I wanted them to learn <clears throat> in areas I wanted them to learn was important. Excuse me. <laughs> so um, that, that became a bit of an issue and, and I'll talk to you about that as I go through different aspects. But in this bit here, some of you who've been in Verbella will recognize this. Um, Verbella uh, is, it offers great conferences and these are called fireside ones. So you can sign up to join them, they're free. And I went to one um, that was led by 
Duncan Wardell, who used to be Disney's um, designer and, and creative person. And, and he was saying, look, you just have to reimagine the issue. And I was like, wow, it's like he's talking directly to me <laughs> because I was really stuck at this point about what I was going to do about this situation I was in with not being able to offer students an learning experience. And he was going, just break it down and call it something else and move forward. And so that's what I did. And I thought, okay, actually, I'm in Verbella now. How could I use Verbella for teaching students without paying money? And Verbella is actually really good about allowing people to go in and have a wander around and have an explore and look at different things. Um, you know, even if you're not there as part of a conference, because I think they charge quite a bit of money to corporate places that, you know, that, that want to bring their teams together for learning. But they do have, um, you know, lots of really interesting areas. They've got a place where you can do team building, which helps you sort of learn how to understand commands and talk to people in a virtual world. Well, that's absolutely ideal for kind of having students working through the complexities of engaging with clients um, within a virtual world. And so here you can see physio, some physiotherapy students who are practicing doing exercises with clients, you know, themselves that they would be telling clients to do, but in a digital world to think about actually, if I say to someone do X, are they gonna end up doing Y? Because I haven't explained how to do it properly within the digital environment. So they were just having a practice here doing that. Now, um, I'll talk a bit more about each of these on, on separate slides. This is students here learning in Second Life. So I'll go on and, and talk about them in a minute. But one of the key things um, I want to say that I'm sure you're all aware of, but I just feel I need to say it anyways, is think about the connectivity. Think about sort of the demand um, on broadband for in the learning areas that this, it might, the students might not have you know, enough connectivity for the areas you want to use and things like that. So be prepared for glitches and think of kind of backup things you can do for the students, additional activities for them perhaps, or alternate activities, um, or even for you if it all goes horribly wrong and it, it doesn't work on the day. So that it's nice and smooth flowing and you look like you know what you're talking about, even if you don't. Um, and also think about your time resource. Do you have capacity to think about how you would deliver your training within these resources? They're free, but they do take time to kind of translate the education aspect that you want to deliver into a virtual world or, a, you know, an online platform. So there is a time resource and think about how you also would be giving instructions to them about how they're going to join. Are you going to meet online in Zoom first, for example, and then all go in together? What are you going to do? So you need to kind of break it down and think about that. Um, so first, we're going to scale it right back and we're going to talk about Miro. Miro is free. Um, as far as I'm concerned, Miro is like Padlet's flashy cousin. We've all got one. It, you know, da -da, they come in and everything works wonderfully and they look amazing. They've got great skin and great clothes. That's Miro. Really easy to use, really easy to set up. I find Padlet a bit glitchy sometimes. Students sometimes struggle using it for whatever reasons. Miro is not like that. It's just so swish. I like it. Um, it can be used for portfolio building. If your students need portfolios, you could do supported revision in there. You can do group work. You can support the group work or you can just step in if needed. So much more. So in this slide that you're looking at here, the students were considering um, where they felt they were in relation to meeting expectations of the nursing and midwifery code. Now, the code um, guides us. It's like our, our Bible as practitioners. We have to uphold the code at every turn we have an image of the profession we must represent that's all there in the code it clearly details what we need to be able to do as practitioners to support women and provide the care they need so these students were in their final year of their program um, of education and within this session they were supporting each other to find solutions to aspects they felt they didn't weren't quite ready to uphold within the code yet keeping in mind they weren't qualified yet but you know at their level as, as level six students um so that's what you can see them doing here um 
and if we just break it down a bit closer here, you can see in here, I've set it up. So I'm talking about the different domains in the code within here. And then I've asked them to put their post-its in there about their feelings of where they feel, one where they were succeeding and one where they needed to improve still. So that's what that was. And then they were going on here and they were then talking to each other and offering solutions where they found they might be able to, um, where they'd found ways to improve themselves or they were commiserating, you know, or, you know, saying, oh, let's get together and have a study group and we'll do this. And it was really good. And I could watch it. And I was there. I was working on other work in the background, but I was also there for them to call me, I think, to let me know they needed me. And then I could pop in and kind of uh, deal with the situation that had arisen or an answer a question that they weren't able to resolve themselves. But it encourages students to be collaborative, encourages them to be co-creative. Um, it's student managed learning um, or peer led learning, whatever you want to call it, uh, with, with me there as support. But it was really driving them to go on and find solutions for themselves. And that's really important, I think, for students because that encourages them to develop into early career professionals where they're not always going to their managers for solutions, but they're confident to kind of source solutions independently or co creatively and then come back and present them as possible solutions. So, this is a way of, you know, giving them those skills. I like Miro. Mentimeter is another one that I really like also free, um, which had it's so in this, this is a, a image I use within a scenario. Um, I use it as an alternative way to um, present scenarios, which partially immerse students. Um, and it pushes them then to put the theory that they've learned to practical use. Um, so this was an image from a presentation I was doing. And I was saying, you'll now be given instruction uh, or information about what happened next within the scenario. And then um, I would give them more information and then I and so I'm kind of building up what they're learning about this in nuanced layers, which is very similar to real life, um, you know, healthcare um, practice. They were then asked to respond to multiple choice questions about what they might do next within the scenario. They were asked if anything was triggering their clinical intuition. And when they start the scenario, they're like, oh, well, of course, it's a safeguarding scenario. So I know there's going to be things that are going to trigger my clinical intuition. But the way I developed it, it doesn't necessarily do that. And then they're left thinking, wait a second, hmm, I'm not sure how I feel about this. And that's real life. So although it's this 2D platform, and actually they're not even seeing really any characters within it, they're being challenged to immerse and feel as if they're in that scenario and in control of what happens. Um, all input is anonymous, um, it, which I think allows them, I know we should be driving students to own comments and things like that, but there's a time and place where we should offer them an an anonymity um, so they can be more open about their personal concerns as an individual without outing themselves as an individual. I think that enhances their learning. Um, and Mentimeter allows you to have live feedback so you and it could be as dynamic and as flexible as you want. I think it supports partnership and education because it allows me to dynamically develop my session delivery, um, depending on kind of their live learner feedback. Students learn at different rates. Um, cohorts learn at different rates as well. And sometimes um, within midwifery, we have um, two campuses, one's in Bournemouth, one's in Portsmouth. And um, so we run our units twice effectively because you know we we have them each running at the, on different campuses so it, each cohort might learn at a different rate and they they may want me to adapt their learning depending because they're at so many different clinical trusts they may see have experiences that the other cohort may not have for example and might not want as much delivery about certain aspects or more delivery about others and by getting feedbacks throughout the day I can then adapt, um, you know, my delivery to be more suited to them. And, and they find that really valuable and it makes them feel that their contribution has been acknowledged and addressed. So it validates their input, I feel. Um, and, and that's really important. They need, well, we all need to feel validated, don't we? So I, I think that's really important that Mentimeter allows me to do that. And then at the end of the day, um, well, 
or what, however it suits. But this feedback I was getting at the end of the day, I was asking them about how they felt about, you know, the topic I was teaching. Um, you know, and you can see that some, you know, they don't just say, oh, yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you so much that they, they're very open about how they feel. You know, um, some of them are saying, well, I still don't feel that confident. And then I'm able to look at what they've said and go, so for whoever said X, Y, or Z, uh, you know, what do you think might be a solution? Well, you know, what does the rest of the class think, you know? And then if they don't feel like talking anymore because it's been a long day, I'll say, why don't you go to um, your, your practice supervisor and, and ask her if, if, you know, she can give you any support? You know, or is there anything that you can attend to enhance your learning before um, you might have the scenario come up again, rather than, you know, what, what's going to happen if your practice supervisor isn't necessarily there at the time, those kind of things. So it, it allows me to tie up any loose ends that I might not be aware are there, is what I'm trying to say in a roundabout way. So Mentimeter also, um, you know, infers control, as I said before. So uh, one of the ways I use it is at the beginning of um, my complex care unit, for example, where we deal with um, care um, planning and management of complex health conditions and emergency situations, they have a, 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 a viva at the end, which makes them very, very nervous, understandably. And um, so they get caught up in little things like their allocation. When, when, what, when, when are they going to be allocated their viva? What date? What time? Um, and they can either self-roster or I can roster them. And whatever I choose is wrong, I've found in the past. So um, I just, on the very first day, open up Mentimeter and let them vote. Would you rather self-roster or be allocated majority vote rules? Works like a charm. Haven't had a problem since then. Makes them feel like they're in control of the decision rather than, you know, me telling them. So there's so many simple ways you can use this that really changes the student experience. And, you know, if we're not about student experience, then I, you know, then we're not earning our money, I suppose. Um, so let's just talk about empathy for a minute, because I think people worry that if we do too much digitally, students lose that kind of human aspect of it and the ability to emphasize. And I, I did talk to you about some of my research and what it showed about uh, humanization of healthcare. So we, you can translate that to humanization of education if you want or whatever, but whatever your profession is that you're teaching within, um, I, I think, you know, we don't need to have fear about students not being able to develop that empathy or losing the de-skilling in that, because there are ways that we can still deliver this even online or offer students opportunities to um, practice it if they feel they de skilled or they don't feel that confident in that. Um, and one of the great ways of doing it is um, the Australia... Um, has developed a virtual empathy museum and it's just brilliant I think that you can see here the dotted lines they highlight sections where people can go in and and do different things and empathy is important I mean empathy is what makes us human right and yes we can become desensitized particularly you know with this gaming culture we have and stuff but going into things like this empathy museum allow us to decompress allow us to resensitize ourselves um, so the Empathy Museum has a simulation room, which provides a number of evidence-based simulations and simulation toolkits. Um, that's really quite good for particularly thinking about um, people who have different abilities and what their needs might be. Um, there's a digital storytelling room, which has a set of narrated video resources. Um, it's got link discussion, reflection questions, that sort of thing. There's an art room, which has art reviews with related uh, discussion and reflection. There's a reading room, which has loads of book reviews um, that, you know, and, and discussion and reflection that you can use in teaching. So the work's kind of done for you. Um, it also helps with developing assessments um, or book clubs, if you're part of a book club, I suppose. Um, there's a film room, which has lots of film reviews, but related to, you know, developing empathy and uh, specifically for use within teaching. There's a meditation room, um, which has uh, uh, an overview of evidence highlighting how mindfulness and meditation can enhance empathy and compassion, reduce compassion fatigue, which I think is quite an important um, and significant thing at the moment. So, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to go back there. Um, so this, this is a, just a summary, I suppose, of some of the experiences that are in there that I've used. I don't know if that's of any use to you, but please do go and explore. At the end of this PowerPoint, there's a resource slide which has got hyperlinks to these aspects, so you can go in and have a look at them. 
Oh, I just want to talk about avatars for a minute. Um, I think sometimes people worry that because I talk about, you know, virtual worlds like Verbellans and Second Life where you have to use avatars. And there, there's other ones as well where you need to use avatars that I'll talk about a bit later on. And I think people worry that avatars make things a bit gamey, but I don't agree. Um, I think that an avatar is really important. It's a self-representation of a, a student's perceived functional, ideal, alternate persona. Um, it gives people a freedom to try new things as alternate versions of themselves. It kind of sometimes maybe puts that distance between them, uh, makes them a bit braver, perhaps. Um, avatars can be used synchronously, asynchronously. Um, sometimes there's, there's problems with persistence, but most of the virtual worlds that you'll go in, your, your avatar will be persistent. Um, and, and often um, the area you left will still be there as well or what you've been doing in there. So uh, I, I think avatars are really important. And I think we shouldn't get too caught up on what our students' avatar looks like when they rock up um, in the virtual environment, the virtual world or the online area where they're learning. Just let them do their thing. They're still going to learn. Um, and you'll see some... In the, pardon me, my dog's decided he needs to bark at someone at the door, I think. Um, you will see some interesting avatars in some of the slides where I show you screen grabs or where I've been in there with students, but it doesn't change their learning. It just makes them more relaxed and it makes them feel they've turned up as how they choose to see themselves that day. So back to Verbella, I told you I went to this, this chat, um, the Fireside chat um, presented by Duncan Wardell. It was really, really useful. Uh, but just to keep in mind, Verbella requires a download. So the students need to be able to download it, have a device they can download it to. It can be quite slow to open, so um, warn students to open it before the session, and you also need to open it before your session starts. But it is compatible with all devices. Uh, I think it's really great. There's lots of in-world stuff you can do. Um, as I said, here we are on, on the beach, um, trying out some physio exercises and, and teaching each other how to use them. You can see one guy's decided to turn up as a cowboy. Um, there's also a ball you can kick here. You can get on a um, speedboat and drive around. That is ridiculously fun, way more fun than it should be. It's just a speedboat, but it's so fun. You can do donuts, all sorts of stuff. That's me and my youngest son there just goofing around a bit so I could take a screenshot um, for this presentation. Uh, so Verbella it, it is great, really. Um, you know, it's best known for conferencing and team building um, and for dancing. There, there's this thing in Verbella where if you go to a conference or you go to, you know, a fireside chat, at the end of it, you get up on stage and dance. I don't get it, but I've now started doing it. Um, it it's not the end of the world if you don't do it, but it is a bit silly and a bit fun. It's really good for time out of the class environment, and it does have practical uses. It isn't just about going and playing, but you can send them off to go and have a play, kick the ball around, drive the speedboat around, explore if they want to um, at the end or for five minutes at the beginning. You can find them because in world you can you can search for people and find out where they are. So I've just blanked out my students' names here. Um, you can also talk to them privately. Now, in Verbella, people can see what you're doing but you can be in a private bubble so that they can't hear what you're saying. You just go into areas you, that are clearly defined. It's free. There's areas within the world that are clearly defined that you can go in and it's a private area for talking. So that's really good when you're talking to students. Um, and th there's a great team building area where you can go in that's also free, where you have to talk each other around a walkway and collect points. It's a bit of a game but you can't see where you're going. So it's sort of like the virtual world equivalent of falling backwards into a circle of arms and trust them they'll catch you. It's a bit like that. Um, so yeah, other users can still see your activity, but uh, not within the team building bit. And, and they can't necessarily, they can't hear you if you're in a private area. Uh, and it's really easy to navigate within Verbella. I highly recommend if you're gonna use a virtual world, Go and have an explore of that first and try that out if you're new to virtual worlds because other ones are are a bit more complicated for example second life now i love second life um i've got a long association with it since you know very early days on second life when it was a thing and all universities had a presence there etc and so on which is less so now unfortunately it has become quite expensive to build on there and stuff but like i've got friends who uh, just one set of friends who met each other on there, lived in different countries, married each other and settled in one country who decades later 
are still happily married. So it's got some really interesting um, uses as well as going on and using it as I do, which is for learning, thinking time, working time, decompression time. I like to be around where there's not a lot of other people. So those are the places I choose to go in Second Life. Now, Second Life probably is best known for some really strange avatars. Um, I look pretty much like myself in here, um, but students rock up with all sorts of weird and wonderful avatars. It is, um, it does offer a lot of opportunities for education, really. I mostly use it as a, as a place to have an office in another space to go there to have quiet thinking and planning time. But it does definitely offer opportunities for education. So here we went whale watching. Um, here we were just, we were on a very quiet island where we were doing some talking and thinking about feelings and kind of, you know, where they were at inside their own heads and not self-sabotaging um, in, in terms of being a student and, and moving forward with their education, those sorts of things. So it, I switched it to night um, evening mode and asked everybody else to switch to evening mode just to kind of change the mood within the environment because of the conversations we were having. There was no one else around to listen to our conversations. Um, and it was very useful for that. But again, you can go on and you can practice doing whatever you feel like practicing with them. There's areas um, for midwifery in there. There's, there's libraries, there's institutions, there's dance bars, there's everything you can possibly imagine in Second Life. Most of it's accessible for free. Some of it's private and you have to be invited only. There, if you're into Doctor Who, there's a whole area where it's all kind of that sort of themed and you can go in there and um, have experiences within there. It does require download again and considerably more time setting up your avatar and learning how to navigate within there. But it's worth it um, if you're more confident with that and you feel you can support newbies to that. Um, most of the time others can see your activity here or read your chat. So it's worth keeping that in mind in terms of safeguarding students and also kind of corralling them to where you want them to be for the learning. But the students that I've introduced to it um, and done sessions with them and it's been really popular with them for freedom of expression and being able to go and have conversations they might not otherwise have about how they're feeling at that time. But there is quite a lot of adult content in there. So in terms of safeguarding students, I wouldn't recommend it if you've got the younger students. It's probably best suited for higher education rather than further education. Anyland um, it does offer, it, when you first go on and you kind of look at the tutorial, it looks like it's all um, hands-free headsets and that sort of thing, but it's not. There are desktop controls. You, you literally build whatever you want and it's free, um, but you, and it's quite time consuming, but you can make bespoke areas for you. So you're not just, you know, restricted, like in Second Life and Verbella, you're going in what they've already designed, um, unless you've got a lot of money you can afford to build in Second Life, which, you know, you would be then spending it on education if you're spending your own money. But any land, it's free, you just go in and build what you want, but it is time consuming. And you, you it is easier if you have a hands-free headset and you can just use your hands, but otherwise there is, if you scroll down, there is instructions for the desktop control controls. So just go and have a look. There's a link to Anyland when you um, get to that bit. I haven't used Mozilla Hubs yet. Um, I found this on Airtable, which is a table that's been uh, Airtable. This is from an Airtable that's been put together by David Burden, who is um, CEO of Dayton. It's free um, to go in and access and, and try out yourself. Um, so I put a link to that and the, um, resource lap and the final slide so you can go in and have a look i i plan on going in it's and and seeing um you know it's free so i'm going to go see how functional it is and i don't really mind things don't look that real it's about being together in a different environment outside of the classroom and, and kind of what that offers in terms of learning for me um so it you know how you feel about it is is different but i'd say go in and try it and, and see you know how easy it is in terms of pathfinding and moving forward, you know, things are happening. So I'm going to go back to referencing healthcare a little bit. Please bear with me. But we now have an NHS X unit, which is a new unit um, consisting of teams from the Department of Health and Social Care, NHS England, NHS Improvement. And it's driving forward the digital transformation of health and social care. So if there's any healthcare practitioners here, 
We're all able to join it. It's on the future NHS collaboration platform, loads of resources, and they want your expertise as well. So get in there and be a part of it. Um, we do this here. Um, this is one of the um, conferences Dave and I um, did together. Um, this is actually Dave's own hands free headset, I think. Um, and um, this is just this was someone from another university who'd come and she was experiencing one of the virtual reality learning environments we had at that time for our students. And you can just see how amazed and how en much enjoyment she was getting from that. Uh, just behind her right hand, you can see um, her within the environment. But the thing to keep in mind is accessibility, I suppose. Not everyone will have hands-free headsets. It is increasing the popularity. They are becoming more affordable. But I do think, you know what, you might just jump, jump to holograms in the near future anyways, right? So I wouldn't get too caught up in that sort of thing. There's lots of platforms where you don't need to have hands-free headsets or headsets of any kind. Students can go in and partially immerse just being online through a web browser. Uh, I think it's important to talk about artificial intelligence a little bit. Um, AI, it, I, I don't, if I'm preaching to converted, I'm really, I really do apologize. I'm not trying to dumb down, but uh, for those who don't know about artificial intelligence, it's a wide ranging branch of computer science. It's concerned with building smart machines. Um, they're machines still at the moment that are capable of performing tasks that typically require human intelligence. Um, Dr. Topol said that if he ran the NHS, his first investment would be in artificial intelligence and a team that led that. We are already using it in the NHS. Um, we've got um, healthy smartphone, um, which does like urine self-testing. We've got um, mammography intelligent assessment. So they analyze standard ma mammograms for breast cancer screening. And, and, and MIA, which is the mammography intelligent assessment AI, is designed to be the second reader in the workflow. So there's always a human in the loop. So um, in, in case like Mia and the first human reader disagree, a second human gets the final call. So radiologists would at the moment always have authority over the AI. But we, you know, we also used it for uh, analyzing chest x-rays in the early parts of the COVID pandemic when there's no way a radiologist you know, uh, or a chest um, consultant could ever have read all those x-rays. Uh, it allowed um, determination of the disease severity. It was clinically useful for diagnosis and prog prognosis to triage patients or manage patients, uh, decision making and so on. AIs are amazing. Um, and we, there is Sophia, I don't know if you know Sophia, she's known as the AI for good. She's joined and contributed to the UN conference on AI and sustainable development. She's the first robot in history. I don't know if robot's the right word, but she's first yeah, first robot in history to be a full citizen of Saudi Arabia. I mean, that's incredible, you know? She's got a sense of humor. Um, she's great. There's loads of videos about her. Um, but what I want us to be thinking about is what happens when AI becomes properly, deeply intelligent. You know, and there's already this, this, this debate going on with, with Google's AI, Lambda, um, whether it has become sentiment and, and Google are saying no, no. And, and, and the person who was working with this AI says, yes, yes. And who knows who's correct. But what, what I think is, you know, when they become properly deeply intelligent, which may have already happened, but we don't know for sure, does this make them actually sentient? And if it does, I think we need to protect the AIs, don't we? Really? Uh, yes, we need to protect ourselves as well. But what about the AIs? If they're sentient or properly deeply intelligent, we need to be starting to think about ethics and their use and their legal rights and things like that now as well. So that's important. Please keep that in mind. The other thing I wanted to say is, you know, it, within this, you know, which is the new future NHS platform, it's still very drop downy, boring, scrolling through things. Perhaps we need to be thinking about making things visually different, uh, particularly if we're going to be getting patients to be using them and stuff. So that, that's also something to think about for students. How do we present things to them? for accessibility, you know, to make it easier to find things? Do we present it in a way that looks more familiar? Last slide, I think, the last couple of slides. This, I want to talk to you about E-Estonia. It's the first country to go fully um, digital. They operate under three pillars, confidentiality, availability, and integrity. Um, every citizen owns their own data. 
uh, I, I suggest you go and have a look at it. I think it's really, really interesting. Internet's been established as a social right. It's freely, freely accessible. It's readily available. They also have lots of virtual experiences they can access. 99% of public services are accessible online, et cetera, and so on. I'm running out of time, so I can't talk anymore about that. But they have already worked through every problem we might be able to go, yeah, but they'll go, we found a solution for it. So have a look at what they've got to say. It's really interesting. Their cybersecurity is so strong and robust. So going forward, I think it's just some things for you to be thinking about, you know, how digital technology plays a part in your existing educational or healthcare, often in your profession. What can you do yourself to move it forward? We've talked about some, you know, free things out there for you. But keep in mind the safeguarding of vulnerable individuals. You know, all students are vulnerable. They all need to be safeguarded. If we're putting them out into these environments as part of our education, thinking about their data protection and so on. Um, so it's perhaps, you know, making sure they've got, been able to make a fully informed consent um, or decision to participate in the learning sessions. And there's just some resources here for you, um, which you can click on to get to um, yourself. So I'm going to stop sharing now um, and take some questions. Um, what were the codes? What codes, Dustin? You said you can't quite see the labels. Sorry, I'm not sure what you weren't able to see. It was when you had uh, lots of um, like sticky notes on the screen, Denise. It looked what well, that's what it looked like. Oh, I see. Yeah, that it. was. Um, I made that deliberately not um, visible because it was students. The students' names were on there, but it was them asking each other questions or saying where they had problems. So the codes were just related to the domains within their code that they were talking about. Our health, our, our nursing and midwifery code of practice. So it wasn't anything applicable to what I was talking about here. It was it was just um, sticky notes that they had for themselves within the Miro that they were working on. Does that answer your question? Hopefully, yes. Um, are there any other questions? Oh, great. I'm glad you found it useful. Thank you. If anyone thinks of any questions that they might have afterwards or when watching this back, please just let Christine know um, and she'll make sure you can get a hold of me or get the question to me or something. We'll figure it out. Perfect. I'm just reading what Mauricio said. Um, he found a simulation tool for science modules called FETID. Is it free? Uh, yes, it is completely free. It's just a tool oh. that has kind of um, uh, pre-designed uh, scenarios, particularly things in, say, maths or engineering, sometimes chemistry and biology, things in the science area, where the student would be able to play with the different options available to see what scenario would cause what outcome so that they can apply that. Amazing. Could you put a link in the chat, please, so everybody can grab that? That would be really good. Yes, actually, it's just fet.colorado.edu. So oh, just thank you very that much. That's yeah, great. Someone's yep, popped that found in. It, Selva. Yep, that one. Brilliant. Um, Sarah has said, um, can I say more about the data and cost to students of engaging? Um, Right. So this is what I was saying, um, Sarah, about sometimes um, you need to have alternate activities set up for students. So with our students, they can come in and they can they can um, use the university Wi-Fi if they wish to. Um, most of our students um, are able that they, they have data plans, so they're able to um, utilize it. But I'm aware that younger students perhaps might not be able to. So um, for students that might not be able to afford it or engage, and you will know your own students better, 
then um, you need to have alternate activities set up that are going to offer them the same kind of learning opportunities. Uh, it may be that, you know, for those students, they would need to do it when they're on campus within the student library or somewhere else where they can practice then. Um, I don't know if, you, if you're a further education or a higher education teacher, but within your campuses, presumably, you know, you would, you would have um, data that the students can use. So uh, in that way, then they don't have to um, be penalized for data poverty or digital poverty. Does that answer your question? Great. Anything like that that you think of, please just let Christine know. I'd be really happy to have conversation with you because it makes me think about things as well. So it's really useful to me too. And thank you very much to Marisho and to Selva for sharing that link to um, FETID, which is um, a simulation tool for science modules. For those of you that weren't aware of it, I certainly wasn't. And I think probably we're coming to the end now and there's going to be someone else starting. But these things are really great, aren't they? When we can get together and we can share things that we know and, and help us help each other be better teachers. Thanks, Denise. That was really helpful. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording.